.NET has a set of command line tools that are excellent. You can create, update, build, and publish an application all from the command line. And that's just scratching the surface of what it can do. In this video, we're gonna look at how to use the command line as well as why it exists and when we take advantage of it. Now, if you don't know me, my name is Tim Corey and my goal is to make learning C-sharp easier. I do that by, by providing videos here on YouTube multiple times per week. Plus, I have a weekly podcast. I also provide courses on C-sharp, web development, and much more at imtimcorey.com. The profits from those sales are what pays for the free content here on YouTube so that everyone can have a great education in C-sharp, not just those who can afford it. Now in this video, as in most of my videos, I'm gonna create some source code. If you wanna copy that source code, use the link in the description. Okay, so we're gonna start off today looking at the command line. So here I have PowerShell open. You can have uh, something else open like uh, command prompt, or if you're on um, Mac or Linux, you can have like bash open or something like that. You just need a command line of some kind. You also need the .NET SDK installed. Now, if you're using a machine that has Visual Studio installed, not VS Code, full Visual Studio, then you probably already have the .NET SDK installed. However, if you don't, then what you can do is you can go to this URL. It's .NET, D-O-T-N-E-T, dot Microsoft.com, and then slash E-N dash U-S slash download. Now, this will change based upon your country, and uh, I will link it down in the description so that you can get the right version. But here I have the Windows selected, so I download the .NET SDK, not the runtime, the SDK. So on Windows, you get the .NET SDK 64-bit version for .NET 6, which is the current version. If it, .NET 7 is out, you can get .NET 7. If you want the .NET 6 and you and .NET 7 is currently out, you can say all versions of .NET. And you can come here and go, oh, I want .NET 5 and select that instead, or .NET 7, which is in preview. You can grab all of these things um, as needed. So back here, if you're on Linux, well, then you go to Linux and just download .NET on Linux. Or Mac, get the .NET SDK 64-bit or ARM 64. And Docker here is a different Docker containers for .NET. So this will allow you to install the software development kit SDK for your version of the op your operating system. All right. Once you have that, you will have the .NET tooling installed. So if you go to your command prompt and just say .NET D O T N E T, you'll see that it comes up with some options. You can get information about .NET, just say dash dash info, and there's the information about .NET, and so on. So this shows that you have .NET installed. So this is what we're gonna to use today to see how to basically bypass the need for Visual Studio and just build an entire application, a, a solution with two projects, linking the two projects, using NuGet packages, uh, building, cleaning, running, um, packaging and publishing, and a lot more, all using the command line. But let's talk first about why would you ever use the command line when Visual Studio exists? And if you have the option to run Visual Studio, most of the time, that's the right choice because of the fact that it has all the nice bells and whistles that we use for building applications. It has IntelliSense, it has IntelliCode, it has nice layouts and GUIs and all the rest. However, there are times when that's maybe not the right choice. One of the things you'll see today is just how fast the command line is. That can be a big strategic bonus to you. You may have Visual Studio, but you may drop into the command line to do certain tasks. For example, we're going to package a executable with the entire .NET 6 SDK in it, and it's gonna take a couple of seconds. It takes a lot more than that when you're running it inside Visual Studio. But since we're on the command line, it doesn't have to do all the nice GUI stuff, it, it goes a lot faster. But there's also the ability on the command line to automate things. 
we do use the, the command line when we're using things like GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps, uh, when we're doing the um, releases or continuous integration, continuous deployment, because we say things like, hey, build my solution, make sure it builds, grab the, the file that it creates during the build and do something with that, publish it, those types of things. Well, that's all done using command line because we script things out. So it's good to know it. But also you could use that same scripting for your own purposes. Maybe you want to create projects that, you know, you have a complicated project setup. You don't want to create a, a multi-project template, but you can create a little batch file and just have that run. And it creates for you a, a full setup project structure with solution project references and all the rest done for you in a matter of seconds. Or, you know, maybe you need to work with VS code because it's faster and you have a slow machine. And so every bit of speed matters. Well, this is a great way to do that where you can build your project out and then use VS code to do the, the code editing. So we're going to look at how to use this command line. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm in the temp directory and notice there is no files in here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to treat this like it's a somewhat real project. So I'll say git init, and this is going to create a new uh, repository locally in with using git that I'm going to start from. So let's start with, um, this is going to just, we're going to call this uh, CLI demo. Okay. So or maybe CLI, yeah, CLI demo. And this stands for command line interface demo. Done. Now notice that create a folder called CLI demo. So I will change directories of CD into the CLI demo. And that goes into here and that folder is empty. Okay. But if we do a get status, we'll see we're on the main branch. So we have Git installed. Well, one of the things that we do when we work with Visual Studio and Git is we have to have a Git ignore file that is uh, specific to Visual Studio that hides or doesn't include some of the things that Visual Studio might create for files. For example, if you publish in Visual Studio, it creates a published directory that has potentially uh, usernames and passwords in it. Well, we don't want to put that into source control. So the git ignore file knows that and it does not include that published profile information. So it's very important to have a git ignore file that's specific to Visual Studio or really to .NET. So we could do that in GitHub by using a checkbox and then searching for the Visual Studio version or on the command line, we say .NET and that by the way, dot net, that command right there is what kicks off any .NET command line uh, command. It's kind of like git, G-I-T, in front of anything is for source control. So .NET, new, and we're going to say git ignore. Done. Okay. But notice over here, we have a git ignore file. In fact, let's open up in VS Code this folder, and we'll see that we have this git ignore file and it's a visual studio git ignore file. So we have, you know, ignore the dot SUO file and we have user, user preferences, ignore those, ignore the build and, or debug and release folders and so on down the list. So this right here is what we want because we want to make sure that we have all the stuff we need to ignored that so we don't put stuff in the repository that we don't want or we shouldn't have in the repository. All right. So now that we have that done. You may be asking the question, well, Tim, how did you know that .NET new git ignore would create the git ignore file? I'm glad you asked. Well, if we do a .NET dash H, that gives you all the commands you can do from .NET. You can scroll up and see there's a list of them. Okay. This is the SDK commands, add, build, and down a list. And they are, make a lot of sense. For example, built, what do you think that does? Well, it builds a .NET project. Clean, it cleans the build outputs of a .NET project. 
Okay, run. What do you think that does? It builds and runs a .NET project. So there's a lot of stuff in here that makes sense. And we did the .NET new. So you may be saying, but Tim, I still don't understand how you knew to do the, um, the .NET new Git ignore. Well, and I hit CLS to clear my screen, just so you know. Um, but if you're on uh, Mac or Linux, I believe it's clear, C-L-E-A-R, instead of CLS. Okay, um, but if I say .NET new, and I don't know what command to do, I do dash H. Now, if I scroll up here, we're gonna see that um, we have more information about what .NET can do. And one of the things we have in here is list. Uh, actually, it's, it's dash dash list, uh, which it's in here somewhere. Um, but so if we come down here again, clear screen, .NET new dash dash list. Here's all the things we can do from the new command line. Now I have some extra things installed from um, when I've been working with other projects. So you'll see a couple of extra things you might not have, but these are the things that are installed. Okay, so if we look here, there's some .NET MAUI stuff, cool. And then you scroll down to the list and you see that we have editor config. If you want editor config, just type .NET new editor config. And then we have NuGet config, or we have page, solution, WinForms, WPF. There's a lot of stuff in here you have to, and there's right there, get ignore. Okay, so there's lots of stuff in here you can you can look around, but we're gonna walk through the the basics today. So we've created a, a new uh, git ignore file. Now what I would do here is I would probably do a git add dot and then a git commit dash m initial commit. All right, and what that does is it it commits that git ignore file to my repository, which now has one file in it. But that way, anytime I do anything now with Visual Studio or with, with .NET, it's already has that git ignore file in its brain. So it knows, okay, ignore any of the sensitive information. Okay, so now that I have that, I'm gonna say .NET new SLN. Now, this is gonna create a new solution file. And it's going to, by default, take the name of the directory it's in, which is CLI demo. Okay, now we notice CLI demo in the directory. Okay, so now we have a solution file, but it's just a solution file, there's nothing inside of it. No problem. Let's create, I'm gonna clear the screen, I'm gonna say .NET new console. But, if I just did this, it's gonna try and use the same directory name as we're in right now. I don't want that. I want my, my projects to be in subfolders and I wanna give them names. It's gonna say dash O for output, demo app. So I call the console app demo app. So I put it in the demo app folder and that's gonna take that folder name. Now I could also say, uh, I believe dash dash name and give it a name as well, but I think just dash O and the, the name you wanna give it is, is fine. So this is gonna create a folder called demo app, and it's gonna create a, pro, a CS project, a console app inside of that folder with that same name. Done. And notice we have demo app now. If we open up VS code, we look inside demo app, we see what we're kinda of used to. We have our program.cs with and let's uh, zoom in here a little bit, our hello world, all right? And we also have the CS proj file, which has, it's an executable file. It's a .NET 6 target framework because I didn't specify it took the latest version. I can specify the framework version if I wanted to. And we have implicit usings and nullable enabled by default. This is the, the standard console app project file. So we have now a, a solution file and we have a project file. What we don't have is a relationship between these two. 
Yes, the solution file is there, but it doesn't really know anything about the project file. Well, we can we can solve that by saying, let's clear screen again, .NET, SLN, add, demo app. What this does, it says, hey, that solution file you have, I want you to add the demo app to the solution file. All right, and now that's done that, and if you go look at the solution file, we would see in here, there is a reference now to demo app. Okay, so it knows about that, that CS proj file now. Okay, so now that has added a reference to our, our solution file. So if we open up in Visual Studio, it would know about the project. Okay, so now we have added that, that project Let's now add a class library. We're gonna try to make this a little bit more complicated, not because we wanna make a cool coded project today, but because I wanna show you kind of the, the standard things you would do when building out a solution in projects. So let's say .NET new class lib. Again, if you did .NET new dash dash list, you can find all the different options. Class lib is one of them. It's gonna create a class library. Now you may be asking, well, Tim, you have not specified what language to use. And if you remember, .NET isn't just about C Sharp. It's also about VB and F Sharp. Well, with these, the default is going to be C Sharp, but you could specify a language and say, actually, I want a VB project or I want an F Sharp project but we're doing C-sharp. So .NET new class lib, and the output is gonna be demo lib for demo library. Same thing as the, the demo app, it's just, and it's done by the way, but it's now created in the, the demo lib folder. And again, if we went and looked at this, we'll see the standard class one in class one.cs and the standard uh, SDK project. Okay. So those are created. Now the solution doesn't know about the library yet, and there is no reference or relationship between demo app and demo lib. We're going to take care of that as well. But first let's do the .NET SLN add demo lib. So we're adding the demo library to the solution. Okay, and now if you go to the solution, we can look and see that in fact, it knows about demo app and demo lib. Both of those are now in the solution. Okay, we can clear those out. So let's now go and do another thing, which is we're gonna add a NuGet package to our library. So we're gonna change directory, CD, go into demo lib. Okay, now we're in the demo lib. If you were to go to the directory, you'd see you have your class one.cs and your CS proj. Now in here, we can say .NET add package dapper. Now we have to be in the project file to do this because the, in the project folder, I'm sorry. And the reason why is because in the project folder, it knows, oh, I wanna add the, the NuGet package to this project. If we're in the solution folder, it doesn't know which product to add it to. So you have to be in the correct project folder. Now I said .NET add package. So it's gonna go to NuGet to find the packages. You can specify a NuGet server if you need to choose a non-standard one, but this is gonna use a standard server. And then Dapper, I have not specified a version which means it will find the latest version, which is the same as what we do if we just found the package and just said install. So this will choose the latest version of Dapper. Now Dapper has to be the name of the package, which means you can't say, you know, D-A-P-P-R or um, something else. You have to have the full name of the package, but Dapper is the full name. So you hit enter, and now it's going to add that, that package to our CS proj file. If we go back to our visual VS code, 
we look at the demo lib.cs proj, really what it's done is it's added this entry right here. That's it. Okay. Now with that, it's you know, it's, it's, um, can do some download back or background, uh, downloading of the packages and stuff like that. But really it's just adding this, this section right here. That's kind of the beauty of the new .NET projects because of the fact that they're very easy to work with the, the CS proj file and the CS proj file is, is easy to understand what's going on. In this case, we just add this. If I want to remove this package from this project, I just delete this. That's it. That's all it would take to delete this reference from my project. So next up, what we're going to do is come over to this project and add a reference, a, uh, uh, a project reference to the library so that the demo app will have access to the demo lib. All right. So let's do that next. To do that, we're going to change directories and go up one level. Now to do that, you hit dot twice. So CD dot dot. I put a space in there. It doesn't really matter. What that does is it goes up one level and I can do the CD demo app and it's going to go back down one level into a different folder. And that is the demo app folder. Again, we're in the folder of the project we want to work on. And this project is going to reference the library project. We don't do it the other way around. The library project does not know about the user interface. The user interface knows about the library. So we're going to say dot net add reference. And remember the dot dot ref means go up one level. We're going to say dot dot slash. That means up one level from where we are right now. Demo lib means go back down in the other folder, which is demo lib and inside that folder, demo lib.cs proj. So we're going to add a reference to the demo lib CS proj file in our demo app project. I hit enter. We're done. Come back over here and notice it added these three lines, which essentially just says, Hey, there's a project reference. And that's the path. That's all it is. Again, if I wanted to remove this reference, I would just delete those three lines. That's all it would take. But now the demo app knows about the demo lib. The demo lib knows about Dapper. Okay. So we've got some wired up stuff now that we're kind of used to. So let's now go and look, and we're actually going to look in the folder structure. Notice we have the OBJ, but we don't have the, the bin directory on either of these. Well, that usually comes when we do a, well, first let's do a .NET restore. What .NET restore does is it makes sure we have all of our NuGet packages. When you get a, a zip file from me that has source code, for example, in the description, there's a link to get this source code that we're creating right now. Well, if you download that, you're not going to have all the NuGet packages with it. We don't include those because they're just a whole bunch of, of taking up space that you don't need because you can do a .NET restore. In Visual Studio, if you do a .NET build, or even here, if you do a .NET build, it's going to do a .NET restore first. But if you want to just restore the packages, say .NET restore, it's going to restore the packages. Okay. So it now has in demo lib, it's download the dapper source code in the OBJ folder. Okay. So that's the first one. Next is .NET build. Now again, remember we don't have the bin directories on either of these, but .NET build is going to build both of our projects. Okay. And we're done. And it took 2.31 seconds. And notice we have a bin directory now for both of them. We go to bin, we have the debug folder inside there, the .NET 6 folder inside there. We actually have our executable. We have our dapper DLL and we have our demo lib DLL. All that comes because of the fact we did a build, All right? Now, if you wanted to get rid of the files in here, if you want to start over, 
normally in Visual Studio, we, we do what's called a dot net or a rebuild because what that does is it does a dot net clean first and that does a dot net built. Well, we can do dot net clean. Done. Notice those, those files disappeared because it deleted all of the temporary files that relate to the build process. You see, when you do a dot, a build in .NET, what it's going to do the first time is build all the resources necessary to have our finished application, our executable. But the second time, it's going to look and say, hey, has anything changed in these things? And if it hasn't changed, it's not going to build it again. It's just going to build the change stuff if possible. It's a, a time-saving thing. It makes things easier when we're debugging it. It shortens that, um, that, that build loop for us. Well, sometimes that can cause an issue. So that's why we have the, the rebuilt, which is a clean and then a build. And the clean, what it does first is it deletes all those files. So we're starting from scratch. We're starting from nothing. So now if we do a .NET build, we're doing a full build again and the files get built, you know, from nothing so that we make sure we have the latest of everything. All right. Now this one is, is interesting because you can say .NET and we're in the demo app folder notice. Okay. We're in the folder of the executable file, not the library. We're going to say .NET run. And it goes, okay. And we get hello world. Well, why did that do that? Well, if we go over to our, our program.cs, we'll see it says hello world. So if I say console right line, how are you like so, and I save that. And then I do a .NET run again, which .NET run does a build first. Hello world, how are you? So that's running our application right on this same console. So we can even run our applications and test it out all from the command line. Now, there is another thing we can do, and that is we can publish our application. Now, with an executable, like a console application, we can create a, a single file application, which means it just has one executable, that's it. And we can also say, I want it to be either framework dependent or framework independent um, or self-contained, I'm sorry. So framework dependent or self-contained. The difference is framework dependent says, hey, I'm just gonna create the application itself. But remember that with .NET, our C-sharp code gets compiled down into intermediate language. And then the .NET part runs it. So that is the, the, the part that converts it over into assembly language and runs it on the computer, executes it. So that system is .NET and it has to be installed on the computer where you run your executable if it's a framework dependent installation. However, with a self-contained installation, it says, you know what? We might not be running this, this application on a computer that has .NET 6 SDK installed or the .NET 6 runtime. So if that's the case, it wouldn't work, but what we'll do instead is we'll put the entire .NET 6 runtime inside of our executable. And that way we have everything we need to run it no matter where it is on whatever machine we're running on, whether it has .NET 6 or not. So we're going to do that. We're going to create a self-contained executable. So let's say .NET publish. And again, we're publishing the, the demo app, the CS proj, that's our executable creation. creation. So .NET publish, we're going to say dash P colon. Now, the dash P colon signifies that we're using MS build properties. So we have MS build, which MS build uh, has a, a lot of tools surrounding the build process. 
And that's kind of the older way of doing things, but we don't have everything in just .NET command line. So we can dip into MS build, but we still have the new command line to run it against. So we're running the new command line .NET stuff, but we're gonna dip into that MS build for a couple of properties. One of them is publish single file equals true. So I'm gonna publish just a single file. Instead of, notice right here, we have all of these files. All these files are necessary, most of them, the PDB isn't, but most of these files are necessary in order to execute this application. But we're gonna collapse all these down into just the exe. That makes it easier to copy and um, send around to other machines. So that's what that does. It creates one executable file. Next up, we're gonna say, don't hit enter yet. We're gonna say dash R. And this, what it's gonna do is determine what, uh, what system this should be built for. Now I'm on Windows, so I have chosen Win-X64. That's a 64-bit executable. Now you may be saying, Tim, how did you know to use Win-64? Well, that's the runtime identifier for the thing I wanted. Now, you may say, well, yeah, but again, how did you figure that out? Well, I will give you a link to this site right here, which is the runtime identifier catalog. And what this does, it tells you all the different runtime identifiers. And it also shows you, and let's kind of zoom in here a little bit. Um, it shows you kind of the, the way it thinks about things. So for instance, any would be any machine. Now we need to specify something a little bit more um, specific than that. We can say just win, which would be for either of these, but we really want to go to 64 bit. But if we wanted to, we could say actually win seven 64 bit, if there's something more specific you want. But really the sweet spot's kind of right here. But again, you may say, but that's an example. Where's all the runtime identifiers? Well, down here. Here's the Windows ones. Only the common values are listed. You don't need to go past common. Usually Windows non-specific version is what you need. So x64, x86. 64 bits, what you want most likely. Now, if you wanted to have something specific for a specific machine, like a Windows 10 machine, even Windows 11, even though it says Windows 10, that's the, the fun part of having operating systems so close together. But um, this will allow you to create something for Windows 10 specifically, which means it might not work on Windows 7. But in our case, non-version specific is good enough, which means it should run on anything from Windows 7 on up. If you're on Linux, there's the different Linux identifiers. If you're on Mac, there's the different Mac identifiers and so on. So I will link to this down in the description so you can have this and uh, use it to identify what you need, okay? So we've got the runtime identifier of WinX64. That is important. You have to specify that when you're saying publish a single file, okay? But we're not done yet. I keep adding to this and I need to have dash dash self dash contain false. Now, um, what this is, is we're saying this is not actually, yes, this is not framework. This is framework dependent. I'm sorry. So what that means is it's going to be just the application itself, not .NET core with it. All right. That's what false means. So we're going to hit enter here. It's going to build it out. And notice we get a, this new folder win x64. If we open that up, there's a new folder called publish. We open that up and we have three files. You may say, didn't you say single file was true? I most definitely did, but we have two PDB uh, files. The PDB files are for debugging. This allows you to attach a debugger in production when it's running and view the code. Okay, so this is a, a mapping thing. So just note that you, if you're actually publishing in production, you want to save the P, the exact PDB file that you created 
when you published your application. You'd put that in a library or put that in a, in a server somewhere so that you can connect to your production server using Visual Studio to debug in production in case something goes wrong, okay? However, the PDB files are not necessary for actually executing your file. So there is the difference there. So notice we have a demo app application. And if we zoom in here on the size, we'll notice 353 kilobytes. That's the size of the application. That is framework dependent, meaning you have to have the .NET 6 SDK install, or I'm sorry, .NET 6 runtime installed in order to execute this executable. Now, maybe you say, I'm not sure if I will or not. No worries. We're gonna hit up once to bring that same command up. Actually, let's clear the screen first. Up once to bring that same command up, we're gonna say self-contained is true. This is now going to be the self-contained executable, meaning it has .NET 6 inside the executable, the runtime version. Hit enter. It's gonna build out. This does take a little bit longer, but it's still very, very quick. And if you look over here, you still see three files, demo app.exe and the two PDB folder files. But if we go over here and look, it's now 62 megabytes. And some people get a little uptight over that because it's a lot of, that's a, that's a big file. Well, not really for an actual executable file. If you look at any executable file on your, on your computer, either it, it is very large or like in most cases, it has a whole bunch of supporting libraries. Well, in our case, we can take this, just this file and pass it around. On any Windows machine, it will run. So that's the benefit of putting the .NET 6 runtime inside of it. Now, if there is different versions of the, of the runtime on a machine, it's not gonna get affected by that. If something were to change, maybe, maybe um, Microsoft does not make, they try very hard not to make breaking changes inside of the same uh, major version. So .NET 6 shouldn't have breaking changes inside of it. However, let's just say for whatever reason, it did. Not a problem for our application because it's still using the, the version that worked when we deployed it. So that's never gonna change. And you may say, well, we kind of want it to change. Then deploy it again. Because you have to test it anyways in the new version, test it and deploy it. So there is a lot of benefits to this. It is larger but it is not enormous by any stretch of the means. So that's the self-contained. Now, if I were to run this like this, it's going to pop up and go away. But if you were to open up a, a terminal window here, and let's clear the screen, I would say dot slash uh, demo app dot exe. Hello world, how are you? So the reason why it flashes and goes away is because we don't have anything stopping the console from, from um, closing because it's done. But if you run from the console, you can see the output because our, our terminal window isn't going to close. So we could solve this in our code by putting a console read line at the end here, and then it would stay open. But in any event, that's how you navigate, get around and work with .NET from the command line. There's lots of stuff you can do here. And like I said, this isn't all about just replacing Visual Studio. If you have Visual Studio or Visual Studio for Mac, great tools, use them. The, the power there is awesome. But if you are working on a build server and you need to do certain things like a .NET restore or a .NET build or a .NET publish, you can do all those things on the build server using these command line tools, which also means that the build server only has to have the .NET SDK installed. It does not need to have Visual Studio installed. That's a big deal. That also means no need for licensing for that, that build server. So lots of good stuff there. Um, I'm sorry, licensing for a full Visual Studio there. I don't think there needs to be licensing for the .NET SD or .NET run I'm sorry, .NET SDK. I don't have licensing for that either, but um, definitely check it out and make sure. So 
there's a lot of things you can do here that aren't just about replacing Visual Studio. Yes, you can use VS Code. You can, you know, pop open your terminal here and say .NET. Actually, that's a change to a uh, demo app. But you pop open your terminal here and say .NET Run like that and run it right from your terminal inside of VS Code. And this can be a much faster experience or even experience that works on uh, slower devices or Linux devices and things like that. In fact, I've got a demo coming up that we're going to use a, a Raspberry Pi and do programming on it. We're gonna build web applications in .NET on a Raspberry Pi because you can, because it, you've got all the options to do so. But in order to do that, you can't use full Visual Studio. It won't run on a Raspberry Pi. But what will run is the command line and also VS Code. So we're gonna use that to work with c -sharp code and execute our application. So it's good to know it. There's a lot of, a lot of need for, especially in the, the build server, the uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment part, but as well as if you're going to Linux using a slower machine, or even if you're on .NET, you just want something a little faster, because quite frankly, this is really fast to build. And Visual Studio can sometimes not be. Also, you can script this. So if you want to script this to run at night or something like that. So that's the .NET command line. There's more to it for sure. The, the big deal is, you know, .NET, because you can say .NET dash H and get help. And then you go into the next level. Um, see, like for example, .NET run any dash H for help. Well, there's not much, well, actually there is. Um, there's how you can run your application and different switches you can use. So you can read more about it. Or you can go to docs.microsoft.com and look up the .NET command line because they've got everything documented really, really well. So you can check that out and learn more about what you need to do from the command line. Okay, I love to have your questions, your thoughts about the .NET command line down in the comments. Let me know what your thoughts are. If you have a suggestion for more you wanna see, then go to suggestions.imtimcorey.com. Leave that suggestion. If you find one that, that resonates with you, make sure you upvote it as well. That's how I pick a lot of my, my video content is what you want, what the community wants. And that comes from the suggestion page. So definitely check that out and leave your, leave your votes or leave your suggestions. All right, thanks for watching. As always, I am Tim Corey.